pastor, and this is the second campus of Hollywood United Methodist Church. And to share today's message with you is such a blessing. For me, and I hope for you. <laughs> Before I go any further, though, let me lift this up in prayer. Help us to put into action the divine call that you have placed upon our hearts to live fully into that call today and always. And humbly, Lord, humbly I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Okay, Grace you and see, you heard the good news from Stephanie, right, this morning? Yeah. Gospel of Luke. Yeah. Gospel of Luke. Now, I have to tell you, the Lord works in mysterious ways. <coughs> yeah. So, ten days ago, Pastor Cedric calls me and he says, okay, here we go. This is what we're going to do. And he says, are you game for it? And I said, sure, let's go for it. Let's side of justice. And uh, I have these options of the scripture, and typically I will lean more toward the New Testament. However, I was drawn, very interestingly, to another scripture passage. And I've learned not to question the Lord. Well, when I do, the Lord still gets what the Lord wants, right? All right, so today you begin a three-week sermon series called Joy the Flip Side of Justice. And so here is where I was drawn. I was drawn to the Old Testament. And it's a lesson from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, and then 10 through 20. And so bear with me as I read the scripture with you and giving you a heads up. This is hard hitting. So here we go. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiel, kings of Judah. Hear the words of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Travel my courts no more, bring offerings as futile, incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation, I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourself. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. Come now, let's argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now over this three-week period of your new sermon series here at Grace UMC, you'll find a common thread, which is the theme of justice. Yet, how often do we combine joy and justice together? Especially when considering what I just read from the book of Isaiah, right? It might make you wonder, uh, Pastor Mark, I'm not quite sure what felt you to leave this, but uh, where's that unspeakable joy? Right? I'm not quite sure I caught it in that passage. Can you show me the joy? And you're right. 
Given history, the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament was not one to hold back. He shows up, and you pretty much know a prophetic diatribe is forthcoming. From the outset, I knew, boom, Isaiah has their undivided attention, and he just lays it out, just what the Lord God has to say. And when he cuts loose, you got to brace yourselves, and you got to hold on for dear life. Because this is what he's saying, I've had enough. I don't delight in, trample my courts no more. You know, bringing the offerings is futile. Incense, that's an abomination to me. I can't endure, my soul hates, I'm weary, and though you make many prayers, I'm not going to listen. Yes. Yes. Wait a minute, God's not going to even listen to our prayers? For heaven's sake, what in the world is going on? This withering assault on our senses here. And you know, when I was putting all this together, it's shocking. It is truly shocking. It's one thing, it's one thing for somebody maybe to come up to you and they say, Ugh, you know, I hate your worship. I, I just hate your worship. That's one thing. But when the Lord God comes in and says, I hate your worship. Oh, who in the church wants to hear that? Right? Nobody. Well, my friends, this isn't just an off-the-cuff statement or express simple opinion. It's not something that we can just put up on a shelf and we can just wait around and deal with it at some other time. No, no, no. This comes from upon high and it's enough fury to wield a fig tree or then some. Why? Why has this come about? And even more so for us. Is there something in God's order of business in this scripture passage from Isaiah that is applicable to us today? Yeah. yeah. Yes, there's plenty. And there's plenty more in the scope of the application that I can cover in today's message. But I'm going to go first to the why. And it's a warning from Isaiah. He's hammering away on Judah, listing their cultic practices of animal sacrifice and incense, plus other rituals of temple worship. And it's a serious problem. This is serious, and it's being called out. But, but, was that really, really the point of what this prophet wanted to get across? In these cultic practices, people, and you get right with worship, and it's all sympathetic. We're all good. We look at this a little bit more deeply, and what we do see here is Isaiah's aim is actually about injustice, oppression, and the other evils being committed. He's directly linking our practice of worship inside the church with our participation in the world outside the walls of the church. He's putting us on notice and strongly asking, where is your full allegiance? Is it with the empires of this world? The empires of adulteries and injustices? Are you aligning with the affluent and politically powerful? Because if that's the case, people, if that's the case and you continue down this path, you're about to go up in flames wishing you had aligned with God. Amen. Isaiah was telling it like it is, sort of like the Howard Cosell of old. <laughs> you see what was being done on the outside of the sanctuary, the practice of injustice is unfortunately being brought Inside, your hands are full of blood. I'm saying that again. Your hands are full of blood. Wow. That's a blistering rebuke. And this past week, after I had been led to this passage of Isaiah, and I'm pondering about it, then it all came to me. Those six words gave me great pause. Your hands are full of blood. For certain, back in the days of long ago, sacrificing animals to be placed on the altar would have covered one's hands in crimson red, right? Nevertheless, I believe what Isaiah was making was a much harsher indictment on behalf of the Holy One. God was rejecting Judah's cult because of the brutality and violence 
being committed against humanity. And in our own context, in the year of 2019, talk about timely. For the image of bloody hands brings to mind, among other examples, the ridiculous number of mass shootings that have occurred in the United States. In just this year alone, in fact, there have been more mass shootings than days in the year to date. In the span of one week alone, after the scripture I was led to this, America witnessed three such incidents at a festival, a Walmart store, and a tavern. And that's not even including a playground in Chicago. All of them supposedly safe places. But then we're safe these days. The latest three in Gilroy, El Paso, and Dayton, totaling 35 deaths and more than 60 injured. And the individuals in that mix of dead and injured covered the swath of humanity, age, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, uh, gender identity, exceptionalities, language, religion, sexual orientation. When newscasters and pundits describe these shootings and they use a word and they say, today's, today's, I don't know about you, but that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart as in today's shooting. But the word today's has to be used. It says a lot about us, all about humanity. For our hands have been and continue to be full of blood when on average a hundred people are killed every day. One hundred people every day due to guns in the United States. With whom are we aligning? Where is our allegiance? If we want to lift our blood-soaked hands to God, well, then what are we supposed to do? Well, in the days of old, yeah, we could have just gone on and we could have just walked over there and washed ourselves, pure ritual purifications, wash ourselves of it, so to speak, and everything would have been good. However, the one and true Redeemer wants something more from us for a deeper purification of our lives in which we live. And understand, that washing, does that come from us? No. no. That washing comes from the hands of God. The question, though, before us the people is, are we willing to do what is required of us? Are we required to do what is required of us? Verses 16 and 17 from today's passage that I read, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. And that's followed by, come now, let's just go ahead and argue it out, says the Lord. <laughs> Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. If you are willing and obedient, if you refuse and rebel, if. Or as my dad would say to me when I was a child, He'd use this phrase, if and when. He'd say, if and when. As in Mark, <laughs> if and when you're ready to stop pouting, if and when you're ready to stop throwing a temper tantrum, if and when you're willing to stop being mean to your sister, etc., etc. <laughs> if and when. And the reading these verses brought all what my dad said to me. And I, and I was then wondering, why, why did he actually use that phrase, if and when? And interestingly, upon reflection, I feel it had, in a roundabout way, the same desire and direction that God wanted for the people of Judah in 
control of us. With the word if, there is uncertainty, right? There's uncertainty. Nothing has been determined as of yet, but a choice is to be made. A choice is to be made. And with that choice, some would say within this scripture passage that a condition follows. Here's my take, though. Rather than saying that God has presented us with a condition, like it being conditional love, I view it more through the lens of consequences. Because my dad's love wasn't conditional. And we all know the Holy Ones definitely. Love is not conditional. But I think what he's saying is, is if you continue to do bad things, if you continue to ignore the issues at hand, then your situation in life is going to worsen. Because you know what's going to happen? It's going to eat you up. And then some. And then by eating you up, it may and will adversely affect others. Our actions, and in fact our inactions, create and have consequences. And then to me, the win part was a signal of positivity for my dad. As in, Mark, I know you're eventually going to come around to make the right choice. Nevertheless, the win part is still unknown, right? For the definition of win states, win is at which time. When hearing these words, when hearing these words is my dad's voice that resounds. If and when you remove the evil doings, if and when you learn to do good, if and when you rescue the oppressed, if and when you will defend the orphan, if and when you will plead for the widow, what happens? Good things, wonderful things, life transforming things, not only for me, not only for you, it's for all of us. When we are learning to do good, we are also seeking social and judicial justice. We are pleading for and defending and protecting the powerless, the oppressed, the most vulnerable. We are caring for them and providing our love and support. What we're doing is we seek change that leads to healthy renewal because Yahweh is urging us, crying out to us to turn around. Turn around. For if we want to lift our hands up to God in prayer, we must also extend our hands to those who are the most vulnerable as well, without a doubt. It is incumbent upon each of us to stand strong in the face of the adversities of this world of which there are many, and in the turbulent, violent storms of hatred. Unfortunately, fear of the other has become the norm, like a mass shooting, or the ice raids that just happened this week of at least 680 immigrants in Mississippi. Yeah. And there's a disturbing sense of resignation and apathy around this, as in thinking, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. Or what, what can we do? We're just a small community. Instead, what we need to do is turn around. God's reign, heaven on earth, is not brought about by our own efforts. It is by placing our fervent hope in the Holy One and by actively centering ourselves with Christ as our beginning and as our end. And that we put ourselves in the position to respond to God's initiative for restoration. And as we, the church, pray, guess what we also have to do? we got to act. We have got to act being courageously led forward to work for a broken and hurting world in a dire need of greater justice, greater freedom, and greater peace. And by doing so, there in lies our joy, our unspeakable joy. That's our true joy. When we see, when we hear, when we notice and experience things in the world in which we live that break our hearts, we need to be asking God's dreams to be restored. We need to be planting the seeds of hope 
and new life. Because there's where God will water and bring those seeds to fruition. Let's shine a light on the darkness. And I mentioned shining a light on the darkness because there's something that President Barack Obama addressed and shared this week in a Twitter social post that did exactly that. And what I want to do is I want to point out that this is just another example of the injustices being experienced by those on the margins and how we must respond. Here's a portion. I just want to read a portion of what he wrote. All of us have to send a clarion call and behave with the values of tolerance and diversity that should be the hallmark of our democracy. We should soundly reject language coming out of the mouths of any of our leaders that feeds a climate of fear and hatred or normalizes racist sentiments. Leaders who demonize those who don't look like us or suggest that other people, including immigrants, threaten our way of life or refer to other people as subhuman or imply that America belongs to just one certain type of people. Such language isn't new. It's been at the root of most human tragedy throughout history, here in America and around the world. It is at the root of slavery and Jim Crow, the Holocaust, the genocide in Rwanda, and ethnic cleansing in the Balkans. It has no place in our politics and our public life, and it's time for the overwhelming majority of Americans of goodwill of every race and faith and political party to say as much clearly and unequivocally. My friends, ours is a costly discipleship. And while President Obama stated it very well, that clarion call is also the hallmark of Christianity. Not one iota of what is happening has a place in the church either. And it's time for the whole of our faith communities across this land and around the world to say such clearly and unequivocally that we've had enough. We've had enough. We've had enough of the fear. We've had enough of this hatred frenzy that has been showing its ugly self in seemingly on a daily basis. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. For as the late Renowned Tony Morrison said, if you can only be tall because someone else is on their knees, then you've got a serious problem. <laughs> we must see as God sees. And that when our paths cross those of another person, we must pause to see them as the divine creator's beloved child and as a person of priceless worth and dignity. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been invited to be agents of God's healing, justice, and love, especially, especially for the poor, the weak, and the vulnerable, and for those who suffer in all the ways in which they suffer. Who's doing that inviting? God. And by being agents of God's healing, justice, and love, that means that we surrender to the will and we surrender to the power of the Most High. There's where we trust and obey as that beautiful song that resonates in churches around the land and it goes, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Alright, I'm bringing this message to a close. The opportunities for us to learn to do good and to seek justice are before us. And there's plenty of opportunities. There's plenty of opportunities to create space for change. Let us choose now. Let us choose now to be the time to trust and obey. For when the, our practices outside the walls of the church matches our practice of worship inside the walls of the church. Watch out. Watch out. Because there's going to be some unspeakable joy. Yes. For joy is the flip side of God's justice when we make choices that follow the Almighty's teachings faithfully. 
Can I get an amen? Amen.